and welcome everyone to WGDR and WGDH's Rules of Radio. I'm Lou Mulvaney Stanek, the station manager, which I will already rename myself so you all can see that in the um, in the Zoom room here. And welcome tonight. Thank you for taking a couple hours tonight to jump into this adventure of making community radio together. Uh, tonight, what we're going to do is have a couple of members of our board and uh, extraordinary volunteers that we have that are slash also programmers help us lead the content where we're going to talk about the rules and regulations of the FCC and of CVCR as an organization, policies and procedures, that kind of stuff. It sounds super dry and boring. I promise you it's not. There is also no expectation that you memorize everything we do tonight. We're going to kind of give you the greatest hits of what are the biggest things to remember and to know about as we go into this. And then you're going to get a very handy station manual that goes into the depth of these different things that you can kind of refer to literally as a manual as that stuff comes up as you're broadcasting to be like, wait, what did they say about call to action? Wait, what did they say about, you know, uh, indecent and obscene and uh, really naughty content? We're going to get into that. See, it's actually more exciting than you than you believe. The FCC cares about the good stuff. Um, so anyway, tonight is just an, an expectation that you open yourself up to the information we're going to give you and know that once you get into making radio, this will all start to make more sense. But it's very important that we get this right collectively as a station. And that's why we lead with this is to kind of give you that context up front. So that said, we're going to start with some introductions altogether. And it's very simple. We're going to just go around the room. And what I'll ask people to do, what I see work in big Zoom rooms like this, is for somebody to introduce themselves Give us one line, one sentence of why you want to make radio. What has brought you here today to want to jump into this adventure of making radio with us? Just one sentence. And then after you're done introducing yourself, pick someone else from the Hollywood Squares here. Maybe I'm aging myself, but that's used to be a TV show. Um, pick someone else and toss it to them, basically. Um, so again, name your pronoun, a one sentence of why you want to make some radio with us, uh, and then pick somebody to go next. Um, so... I will start with passing it off first to Dave Tucker. He's the first person I see on my screen. Uh, so again, name, pronoun, and uh, one sentence about why you're making some, sorry, Dave, why you're making some radio. Well, I, I, I've i been doing this for six years. I'm, I'm here tonight because I'm excited about all of the new programmers coming on. Um, you know, just hoping to do what I can to help help uh, train people and get you uh, get you off on the right foot here. I don't know, Joseph. Up, oh, Joseph, you're muted. Maybe after 25 years, I'll learn how to do this. Um, Joseph Gainza, um, why am I doing radio? Um, because I think it's the best medium in the entire planet for communicating with people about things that matter. Uh, and music that matters. Okay, so uh, Stephen, bang here, bang head here, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can get some better lighting here eventually so you can see me. I hadn't gotten around to putting up a lamp yet. I was just mucking on? about. I was just mucking around in the robot. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, Stephen. Um, I like to do radio, I guess, because uh, I like the sound of my voice and I like to hear, I uh, have things to say that I want people to hear. And um, I guess I like it best when people call in either to agree with what I say or to throttle me because they don't agree with what I say, but I like a good, I like to have a good, um, healthy discussion about stuff and community radio is a good way to make that happen. Uh, whom to pick? Um, I'll just uh, randomly choose someone Someone here whose name is Emma. I don't know you, but now I'm about to find out, I guess. Hi, everybody. I'm Emma. She, her. Um, I am a lifelong listener of WGDR, and I have always felt that it is the best radio station in the world. So I'm really excited to finally be a part of how it is made. Oh, 
let's see. Um, how about, hi, Sedonia. I'm going to call on you. Hello. Uh, I, oh, Sedonia, she, they pronouns. Um, I am a Vermont transplant and was introduced to WGDR by Connie, who's also here. And uh, love, love the programs here. And I've always had a dream of uh, ha being a DJ. So here I am to share music with the world. Oh, um, uh, pick a person. I'll pick Poa. Hi, y'all. I'm Poa. Uh, I use they and he pronouns. And I want to make radio because I really care about aging and living and we all die. And it's good to talk about it. Uh, and I will pick Damien. Yeah, greetings, everyone. Um, Damien Taylor, he, him. And um, yeah, I'm excited to have a show um, playing music and hopefully once I feel more comfortable graduating into more of a show focusing on politics for working class people in Vermont. And, uh, you know, just really interested in music, art and culture, and hopefully we'll be able to find some good stuff to, to play. Um, and I will pass it to Mary. I guess that's me. Um... Am I unmuted? No, I'm muted. You are, yep. Yeah, so um, I was a programmer at GDR for uh, a number of years, uh, Women Stirred Radio, um, originally from Jersey. I identify as she. Um, I think radio is the most untarnished of our media. Um, it has the most points of access. Um, small stations like us, you know, large corporate stations. But the small stations, those are the ones that are the diamonds. And GDR produces a lot of gems. So I have not put in for a show, but I am still extremely committed and, and excited about GDR. And if anyone ever needs... Uh, any help with questions or programming or whatever, I'm, I'm here. And thanks all, thanks all of you for applying. That's what makes us great. I have to pick somebody, how about, oh, uh, Mark. Hey everybody, I'm Mark Michalis. Um, I've been doing a show at, uh, at GDR for um, a long time. I'll just leave it at that, but, but quite a while. Um, and, you know, I do a music show and the reason I love radio is because I'm really passionate about independent artists. And I think that we have such a unique opportunity to, to support both the local independent artists as well as, you know, folks that travel through the area as well. And, you know, they just don't get this opportunity for exposure anyplace else than stations like us. And I just, I don't think you can beat that. So um, that's kind of why I do what I do. So I'll pass it on to Four Directions Farm. How about? Yeah. Hello, my name is Daniel. This is my son, Kellen. And we're going to do a bluegrass show. And it seems like if we don't, get it on community radio that, you know, that genre might disappear. And that's a genre that we feel, and these guys play it. That's all they play. It's kind of all we listen to, but it seems like it's uh, the music of the people of, of, of the land and kind of a Vermonters and farmers. So that's why we're doing it. How about Maria? Hi, I'm Maria and I'm also a big GDR fan. I've been dreaming of making a podcast for the last couple of years. And then when I heard about this, I thought this would be way cooler to have a radio show. And I'll pick um, Susanna. Hi, Maria. <laughs> um, I'm not a programmer. 
I'm not a, a coming up programmer either. I'm a community volunteer for many years. Um, and I have, uh, I'm a long time listener to GDR. And I think in the past GDR has been pretty powerful in its way that it could influence what is going on around here, both politically and musically. And um, when Goddard uh, decided to get, to relieve itself of the station, that's when I became a member of the board. And to me, volunteering for that was important because there was nothing more important than saving the station and making it a community owned venture. So that's why I'm here and I'll pick Connie. Hi, Connie, he, they. Um, when I was moving to Central Vermont, I was like, cool, there's a community radio station. I really wanna be a DJ and share things and be a part of a community. Um, so it feels like a nice circular thing because I get to come back to it. Um, yes. And Serena and Ada, what's up? Hi, I'm Serena, and um, I'll let Ada speak for themselves. But we're we're going to kind of do a combo show where we alternate um, week to week. And uh, I would like to do radio because I like to um, connect with people in lots of different ways, and I like to share um, ideas and curiosities. And I'm looking also for a community to motivate me to explore um, my creative outlets, which sometimes in a vacuum can be hard to pursue. Um, and I'll, I'll pick Ada. <laughs> Next. Um, hey, all, I'm Ada, uh, she, they. <clears throat> um, I went to Goddard like maybe like six years ago. Um, and I turned on the radio at like 2 a.m. and some ambient music was playing and I was really inspired and kind of wowed. Um, and yeah, I'm excited about doing a combo show. We're gonna kind of focus on the, the mundane and dailiness and I really wanna play a lot of different alternative music and I also have fantasized about being a DJ for most of my life. So this is really, really exciting. Um, ooh, ooh. and I'll popcorn to Richie. Hello, Richie, he, him. I actually wrote something. It'll take like one minute so I don't forget or say um or anything. <laughs> um, I just moved here from Texas where their slightly progressive radio station got bombed with actual bombs literally twice, two separate times. Uh, and coming to Vermont to escape that landscape, I feel a sense of never before uh, found freedom and community here. Uh, I feel safe for people to see me, but now I want them to hear me. But I didn't want to be heard for so long, whether it was my high pitched voice didn't match the gruff subject matter I talked about, or my appearance didn't match what I was. The last thing I wanted was to share my voice, but I grew up got on hormones and the world around me got much worse. My intention is to have a platform where I can share music and film and to show a queer voice through such. I want to express my admiration for dirty movies and dirtier music. <laughs> and I'll go to uh, Chris. Thanks, Richie. Solid. Um, I look forward to that. Uh, my name is Chris Buckridge, and um, I am passionately in love with community radio, and I have been for a number of years now because it is a very large and diverse universe, and uh, community radio is probably one of the few, if just about the only places that represents the uh, diversity that exists in the universe, um, sonically anyway. Um, and I'm looking forward to being a part of that here. This is my first time doing radio, uh, uh, previously just a listener. Um, so I will now bounce over to Stephanie. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Lingenfelter, and I am here to co-create, to cultivate a culture of consciousness, compassion, and worldwide peace. 
and through through music, nature, and innovation. And I love talking. I love sharing ideas. I love giving people a platform to talk about their work. And so that will be part of the show. I'll play a little music. And in the beginning, I'm very thankful to get to do the weather with Bob. So that will be cool. And we'll also, I'll transition into an astrological weather report for the week before going into the talk show. So inviting people on to talk about things related to human rights and nature and cultivating compassion and consciousness. And I was on Goddard Radio Four many years ago when my son was little. And, it, and, then, and then we moved to the Northeast Kingdom and I went into um, working full time. So. so I do have a little experience at Goddard and um, I'm looking forward to being part of the community again. And I also have a YouTube channel that I've been doing videos on these topics um, already and a couple episodes on the podcast. So I'm hoping to be able to intertwine the podcast with the radio show. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. I think we're down to Les and maybe Sidonia. So Les, I'll kick it to you first. And uh, then Thanks. I think, yeah. And Les, I'm gonna unmute you here since I know it's your first Zoom. So it should pop up with a button to hit unmute. Got it. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, my name is Les Moss and uh, 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 he, him. Uh, <clears throat> I've been doing a blues show on uh, Northern Vermont University for about 10 years. I like the gentleman that talked about the bluegrass. I have a passion for blues. I believe it's a vital music. I believe it's getting lost. I'm going to keep the blues alive. This gives me an opportunity to do it. And I'm very, very excited to join such a well-rounded team. Thank you. And I'll pass to whoever was left. I'm wrong. Sidonia went. Um, Olivia, I think, or Audrey, I think, are left. I can go. This is Audrey. Uh, my name is Audrey Holman. Uh, they, them pronouns. I make and listen to a lot of radio in the middle of the night, uh, radio for night owls and early, very early risers. And I have a lot of good memories of being sustained by a voice in the darkness in the very early hours and love to continue that tradition. Audrey. And if I'm right, Olivia, I think that you might be our last person unless you went already. No, I have not yeah. gone. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Olivia. She, her, um, works or any, I don't really care. Um, well, I care. I just <laughs> don't have preference. Um, I wanted, to, I want to do radio because I feel like there should be like, you know, like good, um, I mean, like, uh, I want to have fun time. Like I love sharing my stories. I struggle with lots of anxiety. So I really hope to like face my fears of stuff, really talk, uh, really just have a great time. I went to Goddard, uh, had like, I had a little experience there and I ended up loving it. And I never really thought I would. And I just, I don't know, you can, it's, it's a wonderful world. Um, yeah. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Olivia. Antonio, you have a, a wonderful timing coming in here. And Jude, I also see you too. Um, so Jude, I'll kick it to you first. And then uh, Tonio, I think might be the final person here. Hi, I'm Jude. She, I'm um, like Susanna, community volunteer and coming onto this board of Central Vermont Community Radio from having been on the community advisory board from the old WGDR for, I don't know, 10 or 15 or many years. And it's a long time, way back in the 1970s, since I actually had a radio show. And that was fun. It was music and talk combined. 
And um, right now I'm just so enthused and excited to see all your faces, but I'm even more excited to get to hear new shows that you're going to be bringing to the airwaves soon. So yay, nice to be here with you all tonight. Thanks, Jude. Antonio, I think that I think you're last. And if I missed anybody, I'm so enamored with you all. I haven't been actually keeping track. So that's why I've lost track about who's gone and who hasn't yet. But uh, Antonio, I think you've got last word here for introductions. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to, to talk at all, but um, um, I've been doing a, a talk show for the last uh, 15 years. Before that, I did a music show for many years. Um, I'm just really excited to, to see uh, and hear the new programming and, and welcome in these new programmers. And it was wonderful to, to come on just as Olivia was on. Um, I'm really excited to see that she's on the call. And I loved what she said. And I'm, I'm excited to uh, start working with her and training with her. Awesome. Thanks, Tonio. This is a very eclectic group of folks tonight, as you can tell. Lots of wonderful radio is going to be made by all of you. And uh, again, on behalf of everybody at CVCR, I just really appreciate each of you taking your time to um, share parts of yourself with us tonight. Um, and do some learning. And that's what we're gonna transition into next here. Um, I just wanna remind folks, uh, function-wise, Zoom allows you to do captions. So if you wanna turn captions on, if you look at the bottom bar there, you can enable captions uh, and that'll help you kind of follow along. Um, it's a, like having a transcript if you had a podcast or, uh, or did that part of um, audio pieces. Um, I also just want to uh, acknowledge in the, in the intro to answer my question here, answer the radio question. I too have been making radio for a long time. I do a weekly show. And I got my start at GDR, talk about full circle here, 30 years ago at 13 years old as an angsty teenager from Spalding High School. So for you youth who are in the room tonight, you too can one day be a station manager for a community radio station. It's possible, maybe even at GDR in 30 years. Um, and I do a weekly new music show. Um, and my home station right now is WRUV at UVM, but I'm actually a new programmer with you all uh, as well um, as we go into this. And I'm going to bring my show to GDR through this process. So um, yay for music shows, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as new folks are dropping in, um, we're just going to keep going with content, and we'll, if we have time at the end, we'll have the people who come in late introduce themselves at the end, but I want to really get going into the uh, content tonight. So up next, we've got uh, these great slides that we're going to do, and we're going to talk about the goals of the um, presentation tonight, uh, and we're going to share the mic a lot, which is what we try to do as much as possible in community radio. But essentially, we're gonna. We just did what we uh, set out to do first, which is to welcome you into this community radio family. So thank you all for sharing. Uh, tonight, we're gonna introduce you to Central Vermont Community Radio as an organization. So how we make it work, um, basically, and the fact that we are a nonprofit. We are not Goddard College. So if you hear nothing else tonight, help us spread the word that <laughs> GDR and GDH are no longer owned by Goddard. We still live there as a station but we are actually have no uh, official affiliation with Goddard besides that there are landlords. So that's just a really important thing to, to know. Um, and it, it does uh, have a lot of um, kind of ripple out effects uh, in that we're responsible for all the fundraising now, all of the bits and pieces of keeping it running. We don't have Goddard as the overhead anymore. Um, the second thing or third thing we're gonna do tonight is review the main FCC and CVCR regulations and policies. Uh, so that, again, that sounds boring, but it's like where we get to talk about obscenity and indecency and calls to action and uh, how to really uh, leverage this world of community radio to get our voices out there without getting fined and without uh, breaking laws, because there are both fines and laws out there to be, uh, to be levied. And then finally, we're going to briefly review programmer responsibilities. Uh, and again, most of this content lives in our um, our new manual, our station manual, so you don't have to memorize this stuff. Will, we, will you all have a copy of it in your email already as a PDF? Um, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into programming or responsibilities tonight because running a community radio station is a lot like being part of a co-op, a food co-op. Think about it that way, where you've got member hours, where you have to do some work to keep the place going. It's very similar. We don't have bulk bins to fill. We've got, you know, floors to vacuum. We've got stations to turn back on when there's a snowstorm and things like that. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of tonight. And that's the goal for tonight's session. So we're gonna kind of give you the, the wayfinding here of GDR collectively as an organization. As we go along, if you've got questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll monitor that um, and we'll answer them as appropriate or we'll get to them at the end 
if we run totally out of time, uh, I can always follow up with questions um, uh, later over email or, or via phone, um, and we'll keep this uh, going as uh, best we can timing wise tonight. So the agenda is going to, like I said, have these the mic be shared here. Um, so we've got all members, all four members of our board are joining in tonight. So I really appreciate their time to help us um, with that as well. Um, we're going to uh, have them talk a little bit about CVCR as the overview. Um, we're going to have Joseph uh, regale you with our policies tonight. Uh, we'll talk about FCC um, and copyright stuff with Mark, who actually also is our chief op, uh, which is chief operator, an FCC required uh, position at the station. And then finally, we've also got uh, what I call tune up where we're going to talk a little bit about music programmer Rex um, and also the programmer M MOU. So just to kind of give that a little bit more wayfinding with those goals there. That is a picture of the studio. For those of you who have not yet yet getting, gotten in to the station, that's what our studio actually looks like. If you're looking across the board to the person sitting at the, at the, uh, the board. So first, I just wanted to give big picture two main ideas here. What the heck is community radio? How are we different than public radio? How are we different than commercial radio? The biggest answer right there is money. I can tell you right there. Uh, so public radio gets a lot of money from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. If you've ever watched a PBS show on TV, you probably have heard of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting because they proudly announce that they get their millions of dollars from that. Um, but that's essentially the same for any public radio station, like what VPR used to be and what VPR and public uh, television now are in Vermont. Um, when it comes to community radio, we are non-commercial and we are nonprofit. And so essentially that takes us down in degrees, not just in a budget, but also in really hyper-focusing locally on programming. It's essentially programming made by your neighbors is the way that I like to think about it. There are two types of radio stations, community radio stations in the country. There is full power or low power. WGDR and WGDH are both full power stations. Low power stations are stations that are 100 watts or less. Here in Vermont, we actually have 13 community radio stations. The vast majority of them are low power. And by low power, 100 watts, that's a light bulb, y'all. That like means it essentially broadcasts to about, I don't know, a, a couple of miles, square miles. And if you're in Vermont, if you're in a valley, that's even less. Um, so uh, at some other point, I can give you guys the list of those 13 community radio stations. But, uh, but we're one of those 13. We're the oldest and we are the biggest by far as far as reaching um, a, a square footage of Vermont. Um, just a quick reminder to folks, uh, I can't on the fly here figure out who doesn't have their mic, mic, mic muted, but please uh, go ahead and mute if you haven't already. Finally, another unique thing about community radio is that many of us across the country are part of what we call the Pacifica Network, where we share um, shows that are made on our local stations with each other to help other stations fill up their schedules or to help put shows on that are otherwise not being able to be made locally at other stations. So it's a great way over the years that we've gotten wonderful programs at GDR that just are not heard on this coast, for example, like we get a lot of West Coast shows, or how we have actually got um, debuted in Vermont as the first station to ever air Democracy Now. We kind of like, that's where our bragging rights come from in a lot of ways is that we were the first to have Amy Goodman's um, show air and we still air it now. I won't regale you with a play-by-play -play of all of the things that have happened, but you are entering into GDR at a very big moment. We're about to turn 50 years old as a station. And these are just a very few of the milestones, mostly of most recent because CVCR is young by comparison to GDR, ironically. We are about two years old as a nonprofit. And yet as WGDR, we're 50 years old. Literally next month, we flip the switch as a station and it'll be 50 years. Um, since going on the air as GDR. About 13 years ago, we flipped the switch on for WGDH, which is our Hardwick and Woolcott Woolcut, um, located area station. Essentially, that station rebroadcasts what we, you all will be making out of the WGDR studio. So it's essentially two stations for the power of one, if you will. Um, the other big things to know is that, uh, you know, as a nonprofit, we've hit a lot of great big milestones just in the last two years including all of you, I put you guys on here as well, that you are about to help us come back very strong for locally made content. So you're gonna double the number of locally made shows that we have here on the station. So see yourself as part of the history in the, in the making right now. So I'm next gonna uh, send this to um, two board members, Jude and Susanna, who are gonna help you give just a little bit of an overview about CVCR as the brand new nonprofit that we still very much are. And Jude, if you're ready, I'm gonna have you just share the mission that we have as an organization, please. 
Yeah, sure. So um, I'm in very good company. There's people far beyond even the board you see now who had dreams for a long time of bringing um, our radio station into being a real community station, not a hybrid college community station, but our own community station. So really excited that we're there now. We got, um, after some, some moving forward, trying to see if we could locate money to help us become independent, some just questions about what it would look like. God kind of gave us a big push in November of 2019. And they said, oops, sorry, can't you guys anymore. And if you set up um, a community group that we can trust, we, the president of Goddard and with the board of Goddard behind him, will give you these two stations to whatever remains of our kind of old and hired equipment and, uh, and it's yours. So in a period of a month or two, a new community group did form, and uh, it's the people you see here tonight as that beginning board. And one of the many things, we have to set up a whole new organization, and it's part of the organization, just one part of the things we did in the first months was to write a mission statement. And the mission statement is based on some core values that I, if we have time, I might read to you a short list, but the mission itself, I think I'll read, but also you've perhaps all seen it if you've looked at the web page or even at the application form, I think the mission was there. But the mission of Central Vermont Community Radio is to provide a community radio stage which serves the people of North Central Vermont and beyond to provide a forum for cultivating social change. We out a world that harmonizes human communities with the natural world, celebrating diversity, creativity, and freedom. We inform, tame, and educate through the presentation of alternative news, independent arts, and public affairs programming. So for the, to get to this, we um, looked at old Goddard mission statements, Goddard GDR station missions. We then drafted something like this and sent it around to the existing programmers in our community, got some feedback and got this final version, I think finally by June of um, 2022. And this mission comes out of um, just some values that we, which I think are still in a flexible place where we could add or subtract from, but the values that I Think we were working with the idea of um that we wanted to see ourselves living in a healthy reciprocity with the natural world we believed in volunteerism and in listener support we're in inclus inclusivity and diversity civility and respect social justice promotion of a just peace service to the community celebration of local communities and questioning the dominant paradigm or paradigms that we all have to live with now or that we're under the um, cover of. And so I I'll stop there. And if this time we would take questions or Susanna, who I think you're gonna say a few things related to this, if there's anything I've overlooked there, let's, let's talk about right now. Okay, uh, well, when we first took the station from Goddard, we had a lot to do um, as the board, which had a lot of uh, things like working with the FCC and getting insurance and, uh, you know, bylaws, um, all real glory work. Um, uh, but as time went on and we hired a manager, Lou, and, and now we're working on things like um, we just put together a programming committee. We um, work on the budget, the annual budget. We get ready for fundraisers for the fund drive is next month. Um, we are putting together a fundraising committee. Um, largely that's the kind of thing we do. Um, and we have staff, Lou is our staff, um, largely. Um, our She's 32 hours a week, so she's, um, 
the, the, the other staff that we have actually is Chip, our engineer, um, who we, he's on call for um, our many um, issues that we have. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we also have Kristen, who's our bookkeeper and accountant, who's also wonderful. And, um, and gosh, Lou, is that everyone? I'm, I don't know. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we basically subcontract with those couple of other folks, but yeah, we're a small, uh, small and nimble, nimble crew here. And that, that pretty much wraps up yeah. what I Thank was going to share with everyone. Thanks. I'm going to be taking off. We've got sap to boil. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome Thank everyone. You. Yeah. Thank you, Susanna. And thank you, Jude, for those um, quick overviews. Like I said, we're giving you little like sprinkles of different important parts of the station tonight. Um, and we're going to, you're going to learn so much more as you go, not only through the training process, but once you get into doing a show, coming to program or meetings, that kind of stuff. So next, just to give you an overview of, again, how we as a nonprofit operate, um, a huge part of what we've also done in transitioning from ownership from Goddard to uh, CVCR is to be much more transparent about what it takes to pull off two full power radio stations day to day, operationally, when things go wrong and break or go off the air, and also how we pay the bills. These are all real life issues that we, uh, we me and the board face nearly on a daily basis, right, y'all? Um, but also as a collectively uh, community run station that we all hear when we go off the air, obviously, but also feel as programmers when things come up when you're in the studio and that thing starts to beep or, hey, this thing that's supposed to work doesn't work. So we're really deeply in the, um, in the making of radio day in and day out. So we pull this off through a couple of different ways. So as you just heard, we have very few paid staff positions. Uh, the board does a huge uh, amount of the work in visioning and kind of the, um, the as they transition from a founding board into a leadership board here. Uh, but we do have a couple of smaller inner teams that are made up of um, community volunteers and also programmers um, that help us uh, run what we call the robot. The robot is our scheduling software. It is like essentially the heartbeat of the station that really has kept us going through COVID uh, because a lot of our programming had to be brought in for that Pacifica network that I mentioned and uh, be scheduled and to run and make sure that it kept us quite literally on the air. So there's a small team of four of us who are on the robot team and we split a schedule shift every single week. So we each have a couple of days of the week where we're checking down the schedule, making things sure things are ready to roll. And when they go wrong, we're the ones who are responding to, to try to make it, uh, make it right. We also have a small tech and IT team. Um, they've got the task of fixing the gear when it goes, uh, when it gets busted or when it goes off the air due to snowstorms or troubleshooting to just try to figure it out. Um, this is advised by our engineer, but the engineer is expensive. So we try to really figure out what we can on our own. Both of these roles, if you're a techie kind of minded person, we are always looking for people to join the teams and to what we like to call deepen the bench. So if you want to nerd out, if you even if you don't know how to do this stuff, we have taught a lot of people how to do it. And uh, we are very happy to teach you uh, the ways of either the robot, uh, which is more fun than it sounds, or the, the actual gear fixing and troubleshooting. It means a lot of hanging out with me and Mark uh, and also Steven, who's in the other uh, room here tonight. I've also got, and I'll send you guys this link as well, but there's a general kind of ongoing project-based list of volunteer work in general. So if you're not a techie person, um, but you're someone who's willing to help us get things organized or plan parties or be on these little subcommittees that happen here and there, we always have great, a great amount of work to be done. And again, that's where I, I reference this co-op membership model here. So I'll send the link to you. We've kind of keep it as a rotating list. Uh, we also have a list that is physically in the station. So when people come in and you might have an extra hour after your show, uh, you know, there's things like mopping the floors after a particularly like, you know, uh, snowy uh, salt caked floor kind of experience. Uh, and there'll be other projects in the future as well. Finally, right now, we currently roughly operate at an annual budget of somewhere between 80 and $100,000. The reason I say roughly is because we are still brand new. Um, we started our first account, our first fiscal year was only six months. Last year was our very first time making it through a full year. And that was still kind of uh, funky too, because we had a lot of uh, expenses that we were kind of still absorbing from Goddard, so to speak. So we're finding our way and we're kind of figuring out that we're going to be about 80 to $100,000. And this is a very stripped down budget, y'all. So again, in the spirit of transparency, we don't spend it unless we absolutely need to. We really are trying to um, be judicious with um, these funds that we get from a, a diverse amount of ways, but again, in hard-earned hard, hard earned ways. 
So we write grants. We have a handful of major donors. We do these on-air drives that I'll talk a little bit more about later on tonight. We do underwriting, which is our version of advertising. And Dave Tucker is going to give us um, the ins and outs of that shortly. We do typical nonprofit mailings. And soon, because of this year, with our 50th year, we're going to uh, dabble in sponsorships and also some merch sales. So no radio station is a good radio station unless you can get a t-shirt, right? So that's what merch is, t-shirts, uh, that kind of stuff. And so we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the year, uh, but not for right now. But that's essentially how we make up pulling off that fundraising. Um, the vast majority of the fundraising is currently done by me, but the board's about to, um, to create a fundraising committee. So again, as a way to kind of keep flagging ways for you to bring your smarts, talents, and interests into station building here, the fundraising committee is looking for some friends. So uh, it's all about friend raising with fun. Remember, that's what fundraising is about. I am, the jokes are free, y'all. You can feel free to keep giggling on your mutes there. Okay. So with that said, I wanted to um, allow Dave Tucker to just talk a little bit more in depth about underwriting because it is by far the area that we want to grow the most this year and we have the most potential. And so Dave, I'll, I'll toss the mic to you for a few minutes here. Okay. Well, you just said how I was going to start off because underwriting really is the uh, fundraising area where where we do have the most potential for growth. You know, we started off, has it been two years? And it'd be two years this fall, I guess, um, with a couple, three of us, and we spent all of our time, you know, contacting people in and around the Montpelier area. And that went pretty well. We got a number of people signed up. Um, some of those people have, have dropped off, and, and we've been, frankly, been struggling to enlist other people. I'll be honest with you, and, and I've said I'm not talking out of school. I've told Lou this uh, several times. I'm not a salesperson. This is that's not my forte. You know, I started doing this because I wanted to do something to help out, and I'm very happy coordinating all of this. But I'm not the person to be going out and knocking on doors and and you know trying to get people interested or get them started. Um, this worked best in the past when uh, other people and, and Lou's done some of this too. Uh, initiated things and then you know I get in the middle of it and help with you know writing dimensions and so on and so forth but we really do need a lot of help in, the, in that in this area because I it's not something that I can do it's not something I'm good at doing and I try try to not do things I'm not good at um, so so there is a lot of potential there you know uh, selling on or, or underwriting I mean you've all heard VPR I mean they they tons and tons and tons of people, you know, that, you know it's, how do they say, you know, they don't say community support, but we have, you know, they say we have support today from so-and-so in a very brief discussion, description of, of who that company or individual or entity is, and that's it. So if you've heard, heard VPR do it, then we, we're doing it the same way, and uh, but we're doing it for considerably less money than what it costs to uh, to underwrite it at Vermont Public Radio, Vermont Public as they're not called. Um, let's see. You know, when we started, when we started off, and, and, and frankly, too, I mean, some of this because, you know, nobody had ever written down before how to do this. So we started off uh, selling specific shows, you know, enticing underwriters saying, hey, well, you know, you like uh, so and so's show, you know, you like Johnny's Blue show, how about underwriting his show? That, that's okay, but it's not really very practical. We need to be moving into some kind of a methodology where, where we're selling mentions, but you know, maybe we say you, you know, you're buying mentions on public, affair, pro, public affairs programs or differently on music programs, but we're going to pick and choose when those mentions run, just like they do on DPR, because going back and forth with people and picking shows and then they don't like something and they want to change or whatever. It's just a, it's, it, it's, it's really a pain doing that. So, you know, we're, we're looking for new ideas. We're looking for, for new blood, new energy to get into doing this. The sky's the limit. You know, we, we could easily tr triple what we're doing on an annual basis uh, with underwriting, just, just by having more people get involved and say, Hey, yeah, I know this, you know, this business down the street, you know, they're, they're community oriented. They do a lot of great things in this town. They're the type of people who are going to be more likely to say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm into the community. I'll, I'll put up 500 bucks. That's all it costs to get to get a year's worth of a mention 
on uh, on our stations is 500 bucks. Uh, but you know, hitting up the people that are already inclined to, to do that type of community stuff is really, I think, is a route to getting more people um, to uh, jump on it as underwriters for the station. So that's that's about all that I had Good. for this. Unless somebody has questions, I'm happy to to uh, try to answer questions. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um... Again, we're giving you kind of broad strokes here. Underwriting, as Dave was saying, is another great way that you can get involved in helping us and a little goes a long way. So Dave, Dave's right. Like we just need a handful of more underwriters and we will really move that budget, uh, that fundraising line uh, up in our budget. Um, many community radio stations actually make up to a third of their annual budget just off of underwriting. And you know, the key there is that you get them to renew and they come back each year, that kind of thing. And uh, our underwriting has a um, has a range, uh, by the way. So it starts at 500, as Dave was saying, and it can go up to as much as 2,000 uh, for people who really want prime time, drive time. Essentially, underwriting Democracy Now, our most listened to regular show there. Um, so I draw in the link there in the chat. I mean, I I put a link to our underwriting page on our website so people can see our rates and get an idea of who currently underwrites, who is it unwritten in the past, um, and again, we just need a, a small committee of folks to help us get out there and and hit the streets a little bit more and to make some more pitches, both with new folks and also again, to, um, to go back to, um, to get folks to re-up with us. All of this can be trained on, you just need to be charming or willing to be charming and speak the good word of community radio. The next thing I want to br briefly give you an overview on is what an on-air drive is. So for those of you who are totally new, or for those of you who, who listen to GDR and this is your favorite time of year when we pitch on air, <laughs> this is what it's about. Um, on-air drives are the second most popular way for community radio stations to support themselves. And it's one of the most unique fundraisers that only us as community radio stations can pull off because we got the mic and we can tell people exactly what we need, how much we're asking them to give and keep driving them toward, literally driving them towards that goal that we've got. There's a reason you hear public radio stations do drives the way they do it because it works. It's annoying for a purpose. And it's all about frequency of people hearing you ask for, um, for money, but also to immediately then connect the dots to where that money goes. The cool thing about community radio is that literally y'all, a little goes a long way. So our drives happen twice a year right now, in the spring and the fall. We do them for about two weeks. They're live on-air pitching. So again, like what you hear on Vermont Public or any other public radio station you've heard, much like underwriting, it's very similar in the same kind of um, shtick, if you will. Our goal this year for each drive is to raise $10,000 during the spring and $10,000 during the fall. So that's 20,000 bucks. And as if you remember the earlier slide about our budget, that's a good chunk of the overall annual fundraising. Um, the success is all about programmer energy. So that's where the combination of live, but also heart comes into really pulling off a successful drive. And we're coming out of COVID still y'all as an organization, you are like our shining example of what the difference it makes when the community comes together to not just save the station, but fund the station through drives. The fall drive, if folks were listening, if any of you were listening, we said, hey, help us fund bringing in new programmers. And you are the result of that drive in the fall is that you, we got the application together. We get, you know, we're training you right now. And so as we come into the April drive, we're gonna be able to brag and say, you all did it, you donors did it. And now we're ready to tackle the next project, which is to celebrate 50 years of community radio at WGDR and a bunch of other talking points that we'll come up with. Don't worry, we give you scripts and you just kind of rift on it. Um, so again, the drive is gonna be coming right up in April and some of you will be coming on to do shows during this drive. Think of it as an exciting moment to be part of us launching this 50th celebration. It's honestly just about talking about how much you love radio and how excited you are to be here. Everything else is just pointing people to WGDR.org, donate. And we'll get into the talking about the drive as well as we get closer to the drive itself. Um, we give people, again, scripts and things. But drives are really important. And again, it's 100% coming from programmer energy on those things. Really briefly, this is, again, in the, in the um, station manual, but just to kind of, again, set some programmer expectations. The annual calendar for the station really falls into a couple of different categories. We do monthly programmer meetings, and most of these are over Zoom in the colder months, but we're gonna do in-person meetings and take advantage of the warmer months here, and we would meet at the station. And there's always a hybrid, so we, we can get into the details about if you're still not comfortable meeting in groups, but it's essentially outside in-person uh, once we get to warmer months there. 
it's a great way to meet people and to actually create that community connection with that is uh, so unique to community radio. Underwriting, we do year round, much to Dave's chagrin. It's an, it's an ever, ever ending, never ending uh, sport and, uh, and sprint, if you will. Again, April and October are the drives. This year, we're gonna be celebrating the 50th anniversary with some big, big party in October. Um, and so we, we're gonna be making a 50th committee to help plan for that. Again, getting sponsorships, coming up with what the big bash is gonna be about, that kind of thing. And then finally, as an organization, we also are responsible to eventually do an annual meeting, but that's a TBD. So it, that might be combined with the 50th uh, party. Uh, it's kind of a formality that's part of being a nonprofit. But that's essentially the calendar year. So besides doing your show when on whatever rotation you're doing, mostly the thing to remember is that we are doing these monthly programmer meetings and they tend to be the third Tuesday of the month. If that tends to be with all these new programmers coming in, if that starts to be like undoable for folks, uh, we might switch it. But much like tonight, we record those. So if you just can't ever do a Tuesday, you know, a Tuesday night meeting, that's totally cool. You can always listen back. We record the audio for each of them. And uh, again, you get attendance by doing it that way. So the next piece here um, for folks is that we're going to do um, a brief overview on key station practices, if you will, and policies. And so this is the piece where uh, I'm handing off to the wonderful Joseph Gainza to regale us with some of the more important policies that we want to be on the front of people's radars as you join us as an organization. So Joseph, with that wonderful lead up there, I'm wondering if you are ready to take the mic and uh, regale people with your tales of what not to do. <laughs> Uh huh. Thanks, Lou. I, I I get the short end of the stick, so I get the nice introduction. That's great. Thanks a lot, Lou. <clears throat> well, first of all, I just want to th welcome everybody to our community radio station. It's great to have you on. It's very exciting to hear the kinds of programming that you're planning to do here. And please know that those of us who have been around for a longer period of time are always willing to help out in any way we can. Later on, I'll be putting my email address on the chat box so you can contact me if you have any questions. I've been doing my radio show now, Gathering Peace, for 25 years. It's an interview program where we talk about the issues of justice and peace broadly defined locally, globally, uh, nationally, regionally, whatever. So I'm more than willing to help people who are doing any kind of programming, but clearly if you're doing uh, public affairs programming, you might be interested in uh, us having a conversation. I also want to mention that during the drive, since this will be your first time, feel free to give one of us a call so that we can talk with you on the phone over the over the air to talk about the fundraiser so you have somebody to interact with to talk about the fundraiser so that's that's an option you have you don't have to do it alone one of us i know i would be very happy to talk with you on the phone and uh, have the um, our audience listen to our conversation to raise money for the station so just put that in your um, memory bonnet I want to congratulate ourselves, the board, because the smartest thing we did out of all the things we did in the past two years was to hire our station manager, Lou. They've really made a difference in the way this station operates and have enabled us to really move into a promising future. We're 50 years old, but we're only two years old in some ways. And Lou is really bringing us into uh, a time you all being an example of that, of being at a time that when community radio really takes off in central Vermont. And we are a community. And that's one of the reasons why we have policies. Policies are intended to help everybody feel safe, feel secure, to know how to grieve a, a problem that you might have. Uh, we, I'm just only going to briefly mention four of the policies we're in the process of. They're all in draft form at this point. We're in the process of filling out uh, those policies and certainly would be happy as a board to hear any suggestions you might have for any of them. But first, I'll just mention our privacy and confidentiality policy. We really do believe in confidentiality. It's an absolute necessity in a, in a community radio station. And we're only going to be asking people for information that we absolutely need. Your name, 
contact information, your phone number, uh, where you live, if you have uh, somebody that needs to be called in case of an emergency, that kind of information. That will be kept in a locked file in a uh, file cabinet in the radio station. Lou may have your email address on their computer simply because that's the way they're going to com uh, communicating with you. But um, we're going to keep to a minimum the kind of private information that um, we, we're asking for. If you wish to have us have uh, information about uh, your gender or ethnic background, uh, we'll be happy to put it in, but that's totally voluntary. Um, what else? Uh, if you need any accommodations for physical or emotional challenges you might have, we might have that on file, but again, that's totally voluntary on your part. One of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the other policies is anti-harassment. If there's any reason why a person will be dismissed from the privilege of doing a radio show on a Central Vermont Community Radio is if they are sexually or in other ways harassing anybody else associated with the station or anybody who's not associated with the station. Uh, we, we're going to have a very um, clear line that that is not acceptable in in this community and we will make sure that anybody who uh, crosses that line is no longer a part of the the station is the policy itself will have a way to um, provide for people to report harassment uh, to the station manager or if that's not possible because perhaps the station manager is seen to be part of the problem directly to the board. We want to be very open to people who may have a grievance of any sort uh, to be able to either talk with the station manager directly or if that's not possible to talk with the board. Uh, I think you'll have access to all our contact information. So uh, the next thing is a grievance policy. I'm running through this because this is not the most interesting part of the meeting. I'm aware of that. But just to let you know that these do exist. A grievance policy lays out the process by which um, conflicts within the station can be uh, dealt with. Of course, the first step we ask people to do is if they can resolve the conflicts themselves. If not, then reporting either to the station manager or again to the board. There's an entire process that we will have, and we will pay attention to those grievances. This is what community is about. We're not going to just blow it off because uh, we, we have all these big bucks that we're making on this community radio station. The other policy that we've had in place for a long time is the COVID policy. And clearly that's just to make sure that everybody stays healthy. We, we have a responsibility as a board and the radio station and the community as a whole has a responsibility to make sure that we stay healthy and happy in doing this wonderful work of community radio. So we ask people to be very careful about coming into the station. If you're in a common area, we ask you to continue wearing a mask. In the studio, uh, we are allowing guests to come in, but, you know, take the necessary uh, protocols to make sure that they're not carrying something that's going to affect you and other people who use the station. Um, we're in the, in the process of once again revising it. It has been revised several times as state policy and Goddard College policy has changed. We've revised it, but we're still maintaining uh, a high uh, sense of alert about uh, COVID and other contagious uh, diseases. We're a community that comes together, uses common equipment. We have to be more careful uh, than in general places where people gather. Uh, so uh, a COVID policy is there. All of these will be laid out in the station manual in greater detail than what I've, um, what I've had uh, been able to tell you. 
I, again, I just want to welcome you. I also, again, want to invite you to uh, help allow us older folks with more experience to help you uh, feel easier about doing your show. And if during the uh, fun drive you're doing a live show and would like to have somebody to talk with, I, for one, would be happy to do that. I'm sure there are other uh, experienced hands at the station who, who would do the same thing. So I'll put my contact information on the chat so you can contact me if you need help with anything to make your um, experience at, at Central Vermont Community Radio uh, to be everything you want it to be. Okay, that's me. Take care. Thanks, Joseph. Um, I just also have to give major props to our board. These folks have put in the work. I know people say that in a meme kind of way, but they literally are the reason that you are all about to be able to do radio shows. Uh, they salvaged the station from Goddard and have really pulled this off. Um, and there were a lot of moments that we thought it wasn't going to happen, but they all kept rallying. And uh, and I'm just, I'm so proud of each and every one of you. And I really appreciate you all being part of this tonight as well. It's just a, we've made it. We've like, we're at this moment where we're bringing more folks in and it's just wonderful to share the microphone with you all. So thank you, Joseph, for the riveting policy overview. <laughs> I promise you all his, his show gathering piece is much more interesting than policy discussion. Although depending on the topic, sometimes actually maybe not so much, but you know, <laughs> said, said with love, Joseph, said with true, love. True enough, true enough. <laughs> So we're at the halfway point or just a little bit over the halfway point. You all are doing great. If you need to wiggle for a minute, if you need to get up and just move your body for a second, feel free to. Um, we're about to go into the riveting moment of talking about the FCC, the Federal Communications uh, Commission. Um, and this is where I get to hand it off to Mark, who it gets the only official title that the FCC requires of any radio station at all, commercial, public, or community radio, it's the chief operator. And that's essentially the person who babysits the transmitters and does the paperwork essentially in the background, um, but a lot more. Mark does so much more for the station, um, but I gave him the, the this wonderful moment to give you the greatest hits of FCC broad, broadcast rules. And again, this is in the manual. So Mark's just gonna give us an overview uh, to start with. And I'll I'll talk about the fun stuff um, after he's done. But but again, feel free to wiggle if you want. Um, you know, this is still be being recorded. You can turn your, your cameras off if you don't want to see us wiggle. But uh, but Mark, I'm going to hand it off to you for FCC stuff. Okay, great. Well, I think Joseph and I both got short sticks on this because now I get to tell you all the things that are going to cause us trouble if you do it over the air. But um, so, you know, as Lou mentioned, Chief Ops is one of the things that I do. I wear several hats at the station. And um, primarily, it's a compliance type of position where I just want to make sure that we are in line with the many, many requirements that the FCC um, puts out on both commercial and non-commercial radio stations. And so I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. That I, and that doesn't mean that they're not important, because these are extremely important. Um, I think it was Lou mentioned earlier something about, you know, the potential of fines. And this is where we, we get into that territory where we really want to make sure that we avoid any possibility of, of alerting the FCC that things are maybe not quite what they should be. Because, folks, a, a $10,000 fine, which would be at the extreme lowest level of fines that the FCC would, would um, assess to us. And that would only happen after we probably... Um, expend many, many dollars with them, attorney fees and all that stuff to get it worked down. It'd be devastating to us in our budget. So, so while I run through these, don't take that they don't mean that they're not really important, but I know you're not going to really absorb these completely tonight, and that's fine. I'm sure that everybody's going to go through in-person training and that these are going to be well gone over at that time as well. So don't don't worry too much about trying to really, you know, memorize any of this stuff like I would expect you to anyway. But so let's jump right into the emergency alert system. That's the EAS system. It's a requirement that from the FCC has for all broadcast media, television, and um, radio. You've all heard it, whether you recognize that's exactly what it is, but you've all heard those kind of three annoying tones that will come in and out of the blue, and you'll be like, "What? what's going on? Um, we have two um, regular um, tests that we do on a regular basis on the station. They're required. Every week we do a, we a random weekly test. Basically, it's just those three tones 
It's followed by a, another annoying long tone, and then there'll be three quicker tones that basically signals the end of it. The nice thing about the EAS system is it's totally automated. So you as a programmer, you don't have to do a thing other than once it finishes, and it will take over the board, no matter what you're doing, if you're playing music, if you're on the air, when it's time to run, it's going to run. Um, and when it's finished, you'll know it's finished because it'll stop. Um, basically, you just come on and give a station ID. You know, you can say that was a test of our emergency alert system. You don't have to. What you are required to do is just give a station ID, it's WGDR Plainfield, WGDH Hardwick, and then carry on with your show. Um, so there's, there's more I could say about it, but I think the main takeaway with the EAS system is really you don't have to do anything personally yourself. There's no record keeping. It's all automated. Um, the other test that is that you will hear some audio that goes out, it's a monthly test that the state runs. And that one comes through our system as well automatically. Um, but you will hear, hear some audio that goes out with that one as well. So, um, so those are the two types of emergency alerts that, that go out and then required. Plugola or payola, I think, I'm sure you've probably heard the term. Of course, it's um, when you get paid um, or receive benefits for endorsing products, um, specifically over the air, which let me be clear, you cannot do that as a community radio station to begin with, but you certainly cannot take um, anything in kind or in response to doing that. So if folks want to offer you, hey, you know, here's my new CD. If you play it, I'll, um, you know, two tickets to the show are waiting for you or we've got a check in the mail for you, or I'll make a donation to the station. None of that, you know, if you want to play a CD that somebody gives you, that's great, you know, but there's certainly nothing that you can receive in, um, in receipt for doing that. So elections, we could spend a long time on elections. So I'm really going to um, uh, just graze this topic. I know that some new folks are going to be doing public affairs shows, and I think that's really great. And I don't want you to be scared to have political guests, you know, whether they are in office now or if they're candidates running for office, it's all good. Again, the main takeaway on here is you can't endorse them over the air. You know, you don't want to say, you know, we want everybody to vote for Joseph Gaines because he's going to be the best state senator out there. You just can't do that. So, um, <laughs> um, so, so that's that's the one thing. The other thing I would suggest as well is if you are going to have political guests, whether existing um, office holders or folks running for office, it'd be really helpful to get in touch with Lou and me or me. We do have a form. Um, we are required by the FCC to, to track appearances by political um, candidates in particular. Um, so office holders, they kind of fit another um, category. We're not required to report those, but we do have a another quarterly report where we would capture those. So if, you know, again, it's certainly something that it's, it's a great community service to have folks running for office on your show or folks that are in office on your show. Encourage you to do it. Just get in touch with, with Lou or me ahead of time and um, just so we can get you kind of um, squared away with what we're going to need to collect for information on that. Um, public files, that's Part of the reason why we need to collect some of this information for elections, the FCC has um, requirements. Uh, every radio station has a, an electronic public file. You can go to the FCC website and um, there's a search function there and you can actually find both WGDR and WGDH public file. There's specific things that we're required to put in there. Things like our licenses up there that, that goes over our basic parameters for operation, um, applications are in there, ownership um, reports, all kinds of different reports. That's where all that stuff lives. It's open to the public. It's all there and available. But some of these things that I'm talking about, like election um, candidates that are open, up for election, those things have a special place in that public file. And we need to make sure that all of that stuff's in order. As we just went through, um, the transfer of the license, the public file is one of the um, uh, really things that the FCC takes a look at. And actually, we just had both of our licenses renewed. And that's another time when the FCC really goes into those licenses and takes a look 
or I'm sorry, the public file and takes a look. And that's really what they make their um, their uh, decisions about renewing licenses for um, for folks like us. Programmer log, I'm really not gonna say much about this. You'll see this when you come in to do um, uh, live training at the station, but there is a programmer log. And basically from the programmer um, standpoint, um, it's a record of the time that you spend on the air as the operator of the um, station. So you log in that you start your show starts at four and you end at six, you'll log those times in. It's very important to make sure that you do log in every time that you're on the air and you do your show. Um, part of the programmer log is also taking recordings of our transmitter, re, uh, the transmitter readings. We have a, a very, um, it's not tiny, but it's a very small um, variance in where we can transmit legally in terms of our output of our wattage of our transmitter. So we encourage folks to take a look at the transmitter and take readings before they start their show. If you happen to be the first programmer of the day, it's required. We definitely need to get a transmitter reading at the beginning of the day. I think, you know, we're talking about this as time goes on. I think that that one reading is what we're really requiring at this point. But there's no reason that other folks, as you come in to do your show, um, especially if the weather is like we've had the past couple of days, if there's bad weather, storms, those are the types of things that can um, really affect our transmitter output. So we would definitely want you to take readings then. And you'll see on the programmer log, it's a place to just log in. It's very easy to take programmer or uh, transmitter readings. It's uh, just a basically looking at output, output screen. So it's really simple. And it's a nice way to kind of learn the gear a little bit too. So moving on to the DMCA, the Digital Millennium, Millennium Copyright Act. This is one of those laws that has been around that came out in the um, mid to late nineties. And um, this is basically related to digital rights for streaming music. So it's what we do folks, we, we stream our, um, signal as well as it goes out over the air. The DMCA has some requirements that are gonna seem very antiquated to anybody that's, that's, that's familiar with music and streaming services over the, over the net these days. You're gonna say, why in the world um, do I have to comply with this, with these archaic and, and really out of date rules? Well, it's because it's the law. And the reason it's so out of date is because it went into place back as I say, back in the late 90s or so, back when music and file sharing on the internet was really a huge topic. And when you think about um, copyright issues with, um, with musicians, back in those days, of course, those you know pirate radio, it was before the days of Spotify even and all of that stuff. And you know the issue of, of um, copyrights for artists and labels even more at that time, I think were more of a driving force. Um, you know, things were being shared freely and that's just doesn't um, honor the copyrights that are um, that are in place to protect those owners, the, the creators of that um, that content. So basically, uh, real quick, again, this will be available elsewhere and you'll hear it more and more again. But there's really a couple requirements of the DMCA that affect music programmers for sure. I call it the 432 rule. Because basically it means that during your show, um, which everybody's show is going to fall into the time frames that are affected by this, you can't play more than four songs from the same artist. That, so that's the four. The three, you can't play more than three songs from one album. And then the two is you can't play more than two songs back to back from the same album. So four, three, two, no more than four songs from the same artist no more than three songs from the same album, no more than two songs back to back. So I know, again, anybody that's used to, or, you know, streaming services and all of that, and just so you're clear and understand, the streaming services have a completely different license that they operate under. They play a, pay much more fees to be able to provide that content to folks and whatever. Um, so anyway, I, I think you kind of get the picture there. That's kind of um, the requirements that as a music programmer that you just have to play in your show around. It's just kind of one of those things. So um, I'll finish up real quick with copyright laws. I mean, I think everybody knows about copyright laws. That the, why it's important is because 
yeah, I mean, artists and creators of content deserve to get, you know, paid for their, their product that they've, they create. So in addition to this type of, of the music, um, the, you know, where the music comes into play, there are other areas of copyright things that you need to keep in mind. So if you are a public affairs person and you're going to stream a speech from, from somebody or a lecture that somebody has given or um, poetry that maybe somebody has created, you know, it's important for you to reach out to those folks before you air it to get their approval to do so. Because remember that even just because it may be out there on the web or so, it doesn't mean that we have the, um, the permission to air it and broadcast it through the radio station. So just to be safe, it's always a good practice if it's one of those types of things other than, you know, music, um, a music uh, piece of art that is um, out, a commercial piece of music available, you know, just check in with the folks that created it, check in with the person that did the speech or the lecture and um, make sure they're okay with it going out and being broadcast over the air. And um, yeah, I think that's it, Lou. I'm, you know, I'm going real short on the copyright. Any of these things could spend, you know, a whole meeting talking about. I know, Lou, you've had some some cautionary tales with copyright stuff too. I don't know if you want to mention that or not, but um, I, I, I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mark, for the second most riveting part of the uh, the session tonight uh, in rules and regulations, how to not get us fined. Um, yeah, as Mark was just saying, uh, the DMCA thing is just a funky, weird thing to know about music stuff. Uh, so for those of you who love album tributes or artist tributes, like when Prince died, for example, and The Current, which is the huge Minnesota NPR station, just played Prince for like 24-7, and everybody's like, well, they streamed it too. They have, they have, they do a workaround. They basically turn their broadcast station off. So um, we just can't do that. Our, our stream is the same as broadcast. So before you try to get into a debate with me after tonight, just know that we don't do that. Uh, it's just, uh, you have to work around that DMCA thing. It's just a funky thing. And for the copyright thing, um, yeah, I, I'm a 30 year in community programmer and uh, I got threatened with legal action because I used an artist's image that came from the record label um, as one of my like archives I put up on my my personal website where like people can stream the show later on through Mixcloud. So it wasn't even like the streaming stuff. It was the using of an image. So, you know, that that's separate from the broadcast piece, but there are literally companies out there, third party companies who are making money going after people individually for copyright infringement. So this is the strays from radio. My cautionary tale is like, don't use anything you don't have permission for is basically the main thing to know about for copyright. And for us, we have to be very mindful of the rebroadcast. Um, so you cannot just rebroadcast something off of YouTube. You can't just rebroadcast something again that you um, just got a tape of, or if you go to a live show and you tape it and you come on to do it on the air, you can't just rebroadcast that. You always have to get written permission, please. Um, it is way better to deal with the hassle up front than to deal with the fines or legal threats later on. I'll just tell you that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I can regale you more with what happened with my copyright infringement. I'm okay. I didn't get sued but I did have to have some legal fees uh, to protect myself. So um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. As Mark said, there is um, a bit more about each of these two things, DMCA and copyright in the um, kind of a, a appendix of our programmer MOU, because we know how important this is to get right. And we also want to protect you as individuals. So there's the radio station, but again, in our sense of collective care, we don't want any of you wandering into uh, unknowingly wandering into legal issues there. So we'll leave it at that for tonight, at least. You can go to bed thinking, what the heck did I get myself into joining community radio here? We're here to help you. Don't worry. Um, okay, we just have a couple more slides here. You all are doing great. Thank you for absorbing all this information. Again, it is all written down in the station manual in more depth, but we're trying to really hit the greatest hits tonight. So I get the second most fun part about the FCC to go a little bit deeper into the content of what they care most about. And it falls into a couple of different categories. Um, the first one is not so much FCC, it's back to Central Vermont Community Radio. We care deeply about what we call journalistic integrity at the station. And we have a, a, a draft interim policy that will help you kind of wayfind yourself here with this. But this is more important in the age we live in than ever before, because people are making up what is truth, what is facts out there all the time. And community radio is not immune to this. Some people just get radio shows so that they can just spout off about whatever topic they want. 
thinking that free speech protects everything. And one of the big other big things we want you to take away from tonight is to not be afraid of sharing your opinion, but to be responsible for sharing your opinion. So what I mean by that is that this journalistic integrity is is kind of seeped and grounded in our mission as a, as a as an organization. So, you know, we are here to uplift our community and we are here to celebrate the diversity of our community. And so that really is in conflict with what falls into categories like hate speech, for example. It falls into conflict with um, uh, going after somebody on the air, being, uh, you know, kind of um, being, you know, abusive uh, with mere language or accusing people of things. Uh, and again, it's in conflict with uh, anything that you can't cite your sources for. So what I like to kind of sum that up with is saying just because you believe it is true does not make it true. Um, and that comes in a lot of ways as we all watch the news and listen to the news. And again, there's a difference between sharing your opinion and saying, I, DJ Lou, think that Beyonce is the best artist who has ever graced this fine earth. And others might say, well, it's not Beyonce, it's actually Missy Elliott, learn your history here music wise. And I say, well, I'm going to cite my sources and it's going to include Renaissance, the album. It's going to include Lemonade, the album. I'm going deep into my Beyonce fandom here on the fly, but you get the idea. And then someone might say, well, I'm going to reference the discography of Missy Elliott and go into that. And I'm making light of this a little bit, but what I mean is that you actually have to be able to cite your sources and most importantly say that it is your opinion that you are sharing here and here's where it draws from, as opposed to implying that it is the opinion of the station. So Central Vermont Community Radio and WGDR and WGDH have no opinion if Missy Elliott or Beyonce are the better artists. What we are here for is sharing all of the fine music uh, history of them. Um, I could easily insert a public issue right now, like abortion or uh, trans rights or any of the hot button topics right now, but I think you get the idea here. And the reason I pick music as a reference and make a little bit light of it is to show just how important it is to really be clear about your personal opinion and the difference between opinions and um, things like hate speech, which really are against our mission. The journalistic integrity uh, policy is relatively brief. It's in the station manual, but it'll give you a little bit more wayfinding of that. Um, and that's, again, for not just our um, public affairs shows, which tend to wander into those waters more, but it is also for our music shows. You can share your opinions on music shows. Just because you're playing music doesn't mean you can't share you know, what's going on in, you know, the day and age. Often during my music show, when there's been moments of uh, gun violence that you just can't, you know, you can't strip your humanity away sometimes when you're on the air. Sometimes you just need to uh, share what's going on for real. And um, and so we really much, very much encourage that. We encourage you sharing your thoughts on the air, but again, be very clear and check down um, how you do that with the journalistic integrity piece. Uh, and also, again, the difference between free speech and opinion there. Um, again, I'm giving you some quick highlights here, but hopefully folks are able to find their way through this. The one thing the FCC is, is very clear about is a thing called calls to action. This is kind of a little bit antiquated as well, kind of like what Mark was saying about the DMCA and just the funky ways that the FCC is sometimes, but calls to action is you telling a listener to go do this now. So using action verbs like go buy those Beyonce tickets right now. I don't care how much Ticketmaster is selling them for, do it right now. That is a call to action. You could say instead, Beyonce is selling tickets via Ticketmaster. If you're interested in the show, here's where to go get more information. It's a neutral stripping down of sharing information as opposed to directing someone to go do something. Again, you could think of a number of different actual practical, practical ways that this might come up in your show. You can't say go to the farmer's market. You can't say go to the rally at the state house. You can say there's a rally happening at the state house. You can say there's a farmer's market happening on Saturday. So that's real basic call to action. You just kind of have to strip away the go do this uh, concept of it. Finally, there's uh, some extra rules around contests. So I bring this up tonight because oftentimes, especially for music shows, somebody's going to give you a CD to give away. That's technically a contest. Uh, we try to be really limited with what we give away on the air, not just for practical reasons. We don't want people just wandering over to the station to pick stuff up because even um, even if it wasn't COVID, you know, I'm not there 24 seven as staff person uh, and neither are any programmers. We don't just random people showing up saying, hey, I won something, let me pick it up. So, uh, and then you could run into issues of having to mail it, all kinds of stuff. So we can do giveaways. Uh, I would ask you to reach out to me if you wanna start doing that, but the contest rules to the FCC uh, require us to state what our rules are on our website and to be very clear about how you can win when you are sharing, when you are doing contest on the air. So if you want to dabble into any of that, reach out to me first. Uh, there's a little bit of um, kind of basically red tape we have to do to track that. 
Finally, the thing you've all been waiting for all night, what is obscenity, what is indecency, and what is profanity? Well, if you don't, you know it when you see it is what they say, kids. Um, <laughs> and I'm not gonna show it to you and I'm not going to say it to you. But what I'm going to say is that the FCC has a, a great um, kind of quick overview on their actual website. Believe it or not, the FCC gets this down uh, in some ways. But they define these in three different categories that are based on community standards is the best way to kind of think about it. So the thing about obscenity, uh, indecency, and profanity is that in community radio, we actually have what we call safe harbor hours. So you can play content between 10 p.m. and um, I think it's 6 a.m. And Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot here about my timing here. I, I think it's about 6 a.m. in the morning. It's basically overnight when kids are not going to be listening, right? So again, what kids? You can still listen on demand in the archives later. I mean, like, how are we protecting kids these days? We're not here to get into that debate. We're just here to be FCC compliant. So you can play songs that have swears, essentially, between 10 o'clock and 6 in the morning. I generally like to advise folks to say, look, you want to play stuff that people are going to actually want to listen to. So if you're waiting to play that one song that has like a ton of swears in it, I would just ask you to, you know, to definitely not play it unless it's during those um, safe harbor hours, but also just to check yourself down of like, do I really need to play this? Because again, generally we're trying to represent the overall community. And that's true for obscenity and indecent stuff as well. So profanity is essentially bad language and the FCC defines it as the famous seven naughty words. So there's seven words you cannot say on the air, on the air at all. And actually nobody as a programmer, no matter if it's in the safe harbor or not, you can never say swears on the air. That is a massive fine immediately, and it can be it can really bring us down. Um, the seven naughty words are in the station manual. I'm not going to say them. They are a great example of the patriarchy. Uh, we'll just put that out there as how they're related to um, actually, are they swears? I don't know. Uh, we are in 2023 now, um, but you cannot say them. And again, that's the definition of profanity is essentially swear words. Um, and decency is content that portrays sexual or I love this word, excretory organs or activities that can be construed as offensive, aka sex, y'all, right? You cannot be sexually explicit on the air. Again, you as programmers can never go down this road at all. You can have sex ed conversations, but it needs to be very much like, again, just the facts, information out kind of information. You can't kind of like read erotica on the air. You cannot, um, you know, play porn on the air. I mean, like we're really going to extreme examples here, but that's literally what indecency is. And that's that's not protected by um, the safe harbor hours. That's like a never, no, no, can't do it at all. Obscenity is again, related to overtly sexual in nature content. And again, it's stuff that is not protected by the first amendment. So I actually, I, re I reversed those two, I apologize. So obscenity is not protected by the first amendment and decency is, and again, the FCC goes into the details here. But essentially, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll, y'all, uh, when you think about uh, obscenity and indecency, and it's swearing when you think about profanity. So this does actually cover most what music is about, if you actually ever listen to lyrics, uh, but it really is about kind of, again, community standards and what we're trying to really keep ourselves in line with. The number I'm going to put out there, if people ever kind of will go into this, uh, blatantly go into this um, kind of finable offense, is that the finable, the fines are usually around $300,000. That would destroy the radio station. So again, if you take nothing else away from tonight, if you're gonna be dabbling in music, and if you're gonna intentionally be playing a song that you hear has multiple swears in it, and it's not during safe hour, harbor hours, we're gonna be pulling your show. Um, if you let a, a song play accidentally, you know, the word shit in it or something, and you catch it and you're like, oh my gosh, we've got a dump button in the studio that protects us for about 10 seconds. So there's a safe, there's literally a safe button that you hit. It's like the panic button that you see and it pulls it off the air. We also wanna show due diligence. Mistakes happen and if you pull it and you know we, we just move on, fine. But it's for people who are blatantly uh, ignoring these things that really put us in the hot water uh, to get reported to the FCC. And again, it, then it destroys the station. So Mark and I are not here to scare you. We're here to help you keep the station compliant and also keep you guys safe legally. Um, but that's my story of sex, drugs, and rock and roll for you and swearing. And you can kind of get those out, get that all out before you come and do your show, I guess is what I'm trying to say as far as content wise. Okay. Really quick here, I wanted to um, explain the programmer MOU. So a lot of what we've talked about tonight and a lot about what, of what you're going to um, experience as you go into training, either live in the studio or even with the remote made shows, 
is all going to be grounded in what we call the programmer MOU. So this is kind of the station manual um, kind of really summed up. It's your responsibilities as a programmer. And essentially, it covers the fact that you understand the FCC rules, that you understand our station policy rules. Uh, it goes into uh, some other examples that like you're not going to take a sledgehammer to all of our equipment and like let it out that way. Uh, it says that you're going to be a good steward of the station. So you're going to like leave no trace, like pack in what you pack out. Um, it's going to so, uh, you know, say that you're going to show up for each other. So when we've got a big station thing happening, you're going to participate in the drives. You're going to help us celebrate 50 years. Uh, when Lou gets the like, you know, wild idea that we're going to paint the station, you're going to show up on paint day and help us paint. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. You're going to be collectively part of the station's success. Um, and that's what the programmer MOU really goes into. Um, at, by the, before you start your actual show, we will ask you to basically sign this MOU. Uh, and again, it's basically all of what we've covered tonight and a little bit more that is in the station manual there. Um, there is a compliance process that we have basically at a necessity. So this is, your, this is one of those examples of we only get there if we get there. Um, so if you are someone who is... Um, violating station policy or FCC rules, we've got basically a way to track that and say, hey, once one time is an oops, two times is a, hey, what's going on? Three times, we got to have a deeper conversation if this is a fit or not anymore. So again, that's under the big categories of policy, FCC related stuff, that kind of stuff. Um, earlier, what Joseph was talking about, which is our personal conduct with each other, that's a bit of another category. So, you know, we have kind of a zero tolerance about harassment, uh, you know, people making, making people un, uh, unsafe, that kind of stuff. We will have dialogue. We are not afraid of, of having hard conversations in the station. But what, again, we have a zero tolerance for people um, actively and blatantly being hateful or hurtful towards each other. Uh, we're here to have fun. We're here to lift up the community. We're not here to let it out on each other. Um, finally, function-wise, there's three things to know as a programmer. We've got a fun listserv. That is the primary way that I communicate with you all via email when there's stuff going on at the station, whether we're off the air, whether there's a safety thing, whether there's just like basic, hey, here are the talking points for the upcoming drive. So it is expected that you stay somewhat up to date on what's coming out over the listserv. It's a two-way street. So we ask you to use, uh, you know, uh, station or uh, uh, road signs appropriately. In other words, like yield, use caution. You don't have to hit reply all. Make sure it's worth sending that, that reply all email if you really need to. We want to keep email kind of traffic down. Um, we use a source called or a site called Spinatron. If you're a fan of the station, you know this. This is mostly for music playlists. It's a great way that our listeners are able to find out what the heck did you just play? Um, but it's also doubles as a, um, a show page for you that you can access and update a profile picture and put links on and have people be able to reach you basically. And it's connected directly to the station. So we'll talk about Spinatron a bit more during um, other kind of hands-on training parts, but know that that's what that is. Um, and then finally, people have lives, people get sick, snowstorms come. You are going to need subs at some point to, to fill in for your show. And at some point you're probably gonna also need to record what we call an evergreen show. That's a backup for you. You're subbing for yourself essentially for the future. So we'll get into that a bit more during training as well, but it's essentially an evergreen show and it's essentially a recorded version of your show that we have just in the hopper. We have in that scheduler that plays if you randomly can't make it, your car's dead, you can't make it in. And Lou, sorry, it's like an hour before I'm on. I'm like, don't worry, if you've got an evergreen in, we're good to go. Subs are one thing better because it's actually a live person coming in to sub in for your show. And we collectively sub for each other. So you put sub requests out via the listserv usually. And now that we're going to have way more live programmers, this is going to be so much more functional. Um, but that's what subs and evergreen shows are. All right. We're going to have definitely time at the end here for questions. So you all are doing great. We've got one more um, slide here. And I'm throwing it back to the uh, uh, wonderful Dave Tucker, if he's still kicking around here on the Zoom with us just to briefly to do a couple more um, important pieces for music shows to know, and then we're going to do some Q&A, and then we're going to wrap it up for the night. Okay, well, I guess, I guess since Mark and Joseph did the boring parts, I got to do the exciting <laughs> one, right? So, <laughs> so anyway, so what, so what is Spinatron? I, I won't make you wait to find out. Spinatron is a service that catalogs all of the music we play on the station, whether that's on the pure music shows or shows that Include one or more songs. You know, some of the public affairs shows are like that, and we use that service so so that those plays can be reported to the record companies and promoters. 
It's a system that enables us to stay in touch with the labels and promoters so they know when we play their music. And as a result, they send us more music to play. It also allows Mark and I to track the uh, music that's played so it can be reported to the National College of Community Radio Charts. We're currently making weekly reports to NAC for blues, folk, and overall plays, but there's other genres that we could be reporting on as we get more programmers playing that kind of music. Now, here's the thing. You know, Spinatron, like all other music recognition services like Shazam, it's just not perfect. Now, while you're on the air, live or remote, Spinatron records the song titles, artists, and labels for the music played, a couple other things. But there are some common mistakes that it makes. For example, for when an artist first rele releases a single and later that song appears on an album, Spinatron won't know which version you're playing and they default to the info for the single. That's not the end of the world, but it's not completely accurate. Sometimes Spinatron inserts data for music that you didn't play. I've recently noticed that Spinatron seems to think that I play Radio Gaga by Queen on about once every three weeks. It's a song I've never played on my show, but it keeps showing up every once in a while. I'll look at the list and there it is. So every Friday after my show, I go through the Spinatron report and I edit out incorrect data and add anything they missed. Now I do that two reasons. As I've said, it helps to increase the amount of new music we get in, but it's also important if you want to share your playlist with your listeners on social media, it's, it's cool to have an accurate playlist that you can just insert into your, uh, into your uh, uh, Facebook page like I do uh, once a week and you can let people know, here's what I played. And if you want to go listen to it again, it's on, it's on the archive and here's how you do that. Now, I keep saying this, I can't overstate how important it is for us to consistently report what's actually being played. I can tell you when Mark first took over the music department, he was hearing back from some labels that they wouldn't send us music because we didn't report with what we were playing on a regular basis. Now, over the past three years and even during COVID, Mark and I managed to turn that around. And so now instead of getting turned down, we have an increasing number of labels and promoters reaching out to us in music because they can see what we're playing and they think they have an artist or record that fits what we already play and what they would like us to play. I can tell you there's a lot of great music out there. We haven't been taking in primarily because we needed more new music programmers to come on board. As you programmers get on the air and as you let us know about genres that might be represented in what we are already pulling, that might not be represented in what we are already pulling. We can expand the offers and new music for you to play. But in the meantime, we've been getting better organized and we've completed setting up a system to distribute the digital downloads we get every week. So here's the story. This is what's happening. You know, just like vinyl went away for a while and eight track tapes became cassettes and then the cassettes became CDs and CDs are now starting to go away. Um, I would say over the next couple of years, so it's just on the, the rate that they're disappearing, we're just going to continue to receive fewer and fewer physical CDs. Uh, it's already been a problem for people who, uh, music programmers who, who uh, produce their shows from home because they don't have any way to get access to the uh, material that we're getting in. And we didn't have a system in place to distribute it. Now we do. We've got a Dropbox system in place. Mark and I, uh, manage uh, a shared mailbox called music at WGDR. We both have access to that. We also both get um, a lot of offers directly from labels and, and promoters who, who have our personal email addresses and have found it by sending music directly to us and gets it on the air. So that's been going on. Um, so what we do is we add uh, these albums into Dropbox into some specific genre categories and then once a month, we share a link out to all the programmers so you can go out and see what we put into Dropbox for that month. Uh, now, we're only currently doing that on a monthly basis. I, my personal opinion is we need to do it more often, but we're going to see how, how this goes as we get more, uh, more programmers on. So what my pitch is to you tonight is to think about how you're going to incorporate some of the new music that's coming out into your music shows. I don't have a list in front of me, but I know some of you indicated you want to play new music, and there's no better time to do that than, than the beginning. 
and please plan to do it digitally because like I said, pretty soon you're not going to see, see you're not going to see any CDs to correspond what is in Dropbox, even if you go in live to do your show. Now I, I tell you personally, I haven't spun a CD in the station for well over a year. It's probably actually closer to two years now. Um, I use Audacity to put together sets of music and I put those sets on a thumb drive. So then when I go in to do my show, I start a set and it plays three songs, sometimes four songs, and I talk, I play another set of music. That eliminates the possibility that the CD is going to skip, which is, I can tell you, it will really mess with your head if you're in the middle of the show and the CD starts to skip on you because you're not really going to know what to do at first and it's really stressful. Um, but anyways, you know, I just want to be clear. We aren't saying that you can't play CDs or we're not saying that you can only play new music, but every time you play new music, it increases the likelihood we get more great music in. And if you listen around the radio dial locally, you aren't going to find the variety of genres uh, on the radio anymore that we have represented at CBR, both currently and with this new batch of, of programmers. Now, last thing I want to raise with, with you is that you need to be prepared as Lou said, for those times when you can't make a scheduled show time. There's a number of ways of doing that. If you're a live programmer, you can arrange for another programmer to do your show live. If you're a remote programmer, you can prepare an extra show that can be inserted on the robot and be relevant no matter when it happens to run. You know, for example, I was out of town last month and I re-ran two best of the long and winding road shows that I put together last fall. So I had those in the can and they're ready to go. And if you're a live programmer and you can or don't want to find a sub, you, if you have a show recorded and ready to run when you can't make it in, that would really uh, that would really be good. You know, you're you're going to find that people are going to tune into your shows. Uh, you may you may not never know who they are, but believe me, they're out there and they'll tune in and, and they will miss you when you're not there. So at least if you're there, even if it's a, a rebroadcast of the show, people are going to prefer that. And I actually got one more thing on the list. It's important, um, but it wasn't on my list to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it. You need to have a show promo. You need to make a show promo so the station and other programmers can promote your show. Um, you know, it used to be a requirement when, when, when I first got here about six years ago, but it's been hard to enforce that because we weren't letting people into the station and some people didn't have the means to, to record at home in order to do promos and we lost a bunch of shows and some of the shows that are on now just haven't been able to create promos. But that's something that, that you should think about as you're getting ready to do that. And it's something that that, uh, that we can help you with. I'd be willing to help you with it. I know that Bill, I'm volunteering Bill Hahn, even though he's not on this this uh, call, because I know that he's he's offered to help people. He's, he's, um, and he's you know, specifically put together some, some promos uh, on, on behalf of other people. So you'd be willing to help you. I'm willing to help. Uh, there's plenty of people who will do it. Um, what you got to do is you got to learn how to use Audacity and, uh, you know, put it on your computer at home, start playing around with it. And you'll, you'll quickly see how to use it and you'll be off, uh, off with a good start for your shows. So that's all I wanted to cover right now tonight. If you got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, Audacity is the per it's a free uh, audio editing program essentially that will go into for the remote uh, training that's happening in three uh, three weeks from now. Um, all live people are very much welcome to join that training as well. It's not exclusive to remotely made shows, uh, and it is really the handiest way to learn how to do one of these evergreen shows that Dave was just talking about, or other little um, snippets like what we call promos, or essentially like 15, 30 second. Um, self-promotion of your show that we then air other times during the, uh, the during the, the schedule there. So um, thank you everyone who helped present content tonight, especially thank you all new folks who have been absorbing like sponges. And I know if I gave you pop quizzes right now, you'd be able to tell me exactly what is, you know, all of the different things we just went over. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Again, this is what the station manual is about. And tonight was primarily about bringing you all into the room together for the first time and that really lovely opening that we had where everybody was able to bring their voices into the room. And then again, giving you about a solid hour or so of this uh, kind of most important content we want you folks just starting to think about as you approach your shows. 
So we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I know we've been kind of skipping over where folks might have questions. I haven't seen any in the chat. Um, you don't have to have them all right now by any means. Um, you know, tonight again was mostly about giving you some, uh, some overviews and next week is gonna be about the art of radio. So you're going to hear from a panel of current programmers who have a variety of shows. So either live or remotely made or public affairs or music shows. And they're gonna talk to you about how they approach their shows and it's gonna be much more discussion-based and it's going to be, again, back to all of you being able to talk to each other a bit about the cool shows you're all about to do. I know what cool shows are coming onto the air because I've been part of reviewing your applications and talking to you all. But I really next week I'm going to allow uh, we're going to have you guys all talk about that a little bit. Um, the last piece of kind of details for tonight is that uh, there is homework uh, asked for during these next couple of weeks, and that is to read the station manual. Again, you don't need to memorize the policies. At the end of this journey, not only are you going to sign, sign an MOU, but we're also going to have a very short quiz for you to take. If, you're, if you suck it at tests, don't worry. We can always do an accommodation. But it's basically going to be a 10-question quiz, quiz that's going to be the main things to please don't mess up when you do a radio show. Um, and again, you could take the quiz more than once. It's going to be very much based off the station manual and what the training kind of entails tonight. So... Um, you know, when I say read half the station manual, what I mean by that, Stephen, is like the first 30 pages. It's about 60 pages. And you'll see when you open this thing up that those first 30 pages are basically what's the gear in the station? What's the FCC stuff we just talked about tonight? The second half of the station manual is the depths of the policy that Joseph has uh, given you a tease of tonight. Um, but again, those policies really are only there when you need them, right? So you do not have to memorize them. Uh, it is there. Just know that they exist. Really, um, you don't have to go into the weeds. So this is not reading an entire book between the next couple of weeks. This is you just kind of getting familiar with the, what this manual is, and it's meant to be a working document. So we are taking feedback on it, but it's also something that you can go back and reference uh, when and how you need it. So I'm going to pause there and see if folks do have any burning questions for the good of the larger group. If you have individual specific questions. You know how to get in contact with me. I'm a texter. I'm an emailer. I'm a phone caller. Um, you know, I'm always happy to answer questions offline. But if there's folks that have questions, um, <laughs> policy teaser is an oxymoron. Uh, feel free to either put them in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and, and ask a question um, as we have these last couple of minutes together tonight. It can also be that we were just so riveting and so on it with our first time doing this that you all are like, Psh, no questions, 100% ready, got it, don't, don't make the FCC angry. Um, yeah. Hi. Hey. Uh, I saw Connie's chat and felt like that question was also my question. Got it. So the, the question back there was, so is playable music limited to what um, is in the station's database? You can't stream stuff from Spotify or Bandcamp. I feel like this was a plant question, Connie, because this is a really good question. So you all read terms and conditions. I know you do. When you sign up for a service like YouTube or Hulu or Netflix, and they give you that box, that legal box that says, read the terms and conditions. There's 700 pages out of them. I know you read them. I do. I read them too. But in case you don't, know that every single one of them has a very specific legal clause that says, you cannot rebroadcast content off of this platform. Spotify's in that, um, YouTube's in that, Hulu's in that, Netflix in that, like, you know, wherever you can find documentaries, anything pretty much you can stream off the internet. And if it's like an actual legit site, it has terms and conditions that has do not rebroadcast. I think often of the NFL, when they announce that during the do not rebroadcast these blah, blah, blah. If you're a football fan, you hear this all the time at this point. But that's what that literally means, is that you cannot rebroadcast this on radio stations. It's like they're after us or something. So it is my responsibility legally as a station manager to say you cannot use Spotify. Bandcamp, I think, is a similar thing. And, and Mark, I'm going to, that, that's like a little bit in the gray area for me because it's not, I don't think you actually ever uh, kind of click the terms and conditions, but you can't use Spotify. You can't use YouTube like that. You can't use Amazon Music, uh, you know, any of those other streaming services. So it either needs to be from you, like you personally own this uh, and you bought it through the record label, uh, or through the, excuse me, record store, or it needs to come from our vast library. And y'all, if you haven't been to the station yet, we have, I would argue, one of the biggest music libraries that still exists for a radio station. So, uh, and again, it's been updated and we've, we've converted it to digital. So there's a lot for you to access, but 
that's how I'd answer that question. And Mark, I'm going to look to you as my fellow uh, kind of want wah music policy person to uh, to see if you have anything to add to that one. No, I think you covered it, Lou. Um, basically, just kind of think, like Lou says, yeah, I mean, this is one of those areas where it's protecting you as much as it is the station, because if you violate those terms of service, you know, there, there could potentially be consequences. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I will add that um, it's a perk to get the digital Dropbox link once a month, y'all. Like you can go in there and that's music that you get then to play at home too. So, you know, it's a nice inner perk there. Um, I will also add that we are now further enough into our culture of making music and stuff that the copyright rules of the 99 years are starting to drop for stuff that was made back in the, you know, I'm serious, like back in the twenties, I mean, like poor Disney just had to release, you know, certain elements of the very beginning of Mickey Mouse even. So uh, there is stuff that's coming into what we, what is called the public domain. So if you're somebody that wants to dabble in kind of audio, kind of like interesting little snippets and stuff, like what I would recommend is go back in time and really start to pull from uh, things that are called the common, the um, collective creative commons online. And there's other places that are copyright free uh, and you want to definitely be looking for that kind of stuff that's essentially, you know, used with permission there. Um, but again, that's the quick answer for music streaming services is that you um, you can't use it. Uh, and certainly it's one of those things like just don't even it's, it's us protecting you because you're the one who clicked off on terms and conditions that you would not rebroadcast. Um, could someone prove it? They'd have to be sitting in the studio with you. I'll be it, 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 completely transparent. However, it's better to not like hate yourself later on. Uh, that you did that. Um, Stephanie, I see your hand up. What a convenient feature. Um, so if we know, if we have a music artist that the station doesn't have their music oh, yeah. and they're interested in allowing us to play it, what would I want to do? Yeah, so that's permission straight up, uh, they, they, you know, they, maybe they cut it themselves at a local studio or something like that. Um, that's totally fine. One thing Mark didn't get into, and Mark, I can see you maybe about to mention our, what we do pay into for our subscription services for all of the um, services. So I'll, I'll let you answer the rest of that, Mark. Yeah, actually, I was just going to say, if you, if you've got connections with anybody in the music industry or artists or whatever, you know, get a copy for the station because then everybody can play it. And, right. you know, folks, you know, the the wonderful thing with digital files and digital music is, you know, it costs them virtually nothing to send you an MP3. And we can, you know, now's the time, like Dave was saying, we're, our digital collection is growing every single day. There is a ton of stuff. And we would love, especially local folks, but anybody, you know, so yeah, if you've got connections, get it to us. Everybody can play it then. And it's perfectly legal for everybody then. So yeah. That's what I was wondering. I I just the part I didn't understand was if they if I want if they want to give to allow the station to play the music whenever they just send an MP3 to me or to one of you, or is that either way? It. I mean, there's, it, there's no written like they don't have to sign for that they give us permission. Them just giving it to us is enough. Yeah, that's just enough. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, Maria, I see your yellow hand up. Yeah. So how can we access the digital um, music collection of GDR? Do we have to go there or can we, because I'd love to start browsing it now and figure out what's there. The uh, the the digital music, the, there's two things we got going there. We got a digital music library that's been built up over the years. It's got, it's got some really good older material in it that's currently only accessible well actually i'm not even sure that we can get into the dml right now mark but uh, if, if we can't get into it there, there were some technical things going on but if we can't get into it it's only accessible at the station at best what we're doing with the dropbox account is we're, we're putting oh i don't know i counted them uh one month we had uh, we had over 75 new albums that we put put into the Dropbox that month. And, and at the end of the month, Mark sends out a link to the programmers. And if you click on the link, then you access the Dropbox account, and then you're able to go through and check out, you know, you can sample the music or, and if you find something you want or either a song or an album, you can download it from, from that account. But uh, 
the the bigger the the bigger access to some of the older material that we've got um, in the digital music library, we haven't quite figured out how to do that um, and share it both internally at the station and for remote programmers. We're still, and we haven't got there yet. Does that help? Great. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, we're working on some inner technical stuff still, but um, but yeah, between the physical library and what's starting to get collected digitally, uh, we are very aware that remote programmers need access and need help with this. And just in case it's not clear, if something is, if a band recorded to any kind of a label, that's totally covered to be able to be played. So again, you can either bring that CD, that record, your own digital ver for, uh, format of that into the station to play. That's totally fine because uh, we pay like CSAC and BMI. These are like licensing fees. Um, it's literally how we do broadcast and we do it for both broadcast and for streaming. So that's how, uh, you know, we kind of cover our butts, so to speak, with that. Um, it is eight o'clock on the dot. You committed two hours for tonight. So I just want to acknowledge that anybody who needs to bounce, feel free. Anybody who wants to stick around a little bit longer, and if you've got more questions, I'm definitely willing to stick around, but don't feel like you need to um, just stick around longer. We have covered what we wanted to cover tonight, but uh, again, we're happy to uh, to answer any other questions. Or again, individually, you and I can connect as well. Um, but yeah, you all, I mean, it's radio. We don't get to see each other's faces often. So this is a bonus of Zoom, y'all, right? Um, so if folks want to sign off, go for it. We will see you next week for the panel. And again, thank you so much for your time. We're so excited to have you part of the community. Oh, Stephen, yeah, you got a question. Yeah, most of the um, uh, conversation tonight seems to be aimed at the idea that most folks are going to um, embark upon a program. And I was wondering if there's any consideration or uh, uh, discussion about folks pairing off for the purpose of producing talk shows. Um, and if, you're, if that's what you're interested in, <laughs> A solo talk show can get dry and boring pretty fast. Nobody really wants to listen to a monologue, but a discussion can be kind of interesting and is will be more likely to attract callers. So I just wondered if anybody has indicated that they're interested in that. Yeah, I mean, both for applications of shows coming in, folks are either bringing their co-hosts with them um, or uh, they're going to plan to have guests kind of come in. But I, but part of bringing this community together, you know, via the listserv, I think folks can share and ask if people want to co-host with them, even one-offs here and there, like, you know, Stephen, if you wanted to put out, not just to current folks, but these new folks coming in for inviting folks in to, you know, either have a regular hosting slot with you or whatnot, that's what this intermingling is all about. So uh, I think it's a great idea, but there wasn't anybody specifically who's in this new cohort who said, hey, I'm looking for a co-host. <clears throat> um, but yeah, keep that as an idea, I think, and pitch it uh, once we um, bring the whole listserv up to speed. So follow-up question, if someone's bringing on a co-host, do they not need to go through this same training? No, they do, and they are. You've actually seen a couple people sitting in on their Zooms with their co-hosts. So, uh, you know, Daniel and Kellen are an example. Um, uh, Ada and uh, Serena were another example tonight. Um, I think those are our only co-hosted shows right now. And some of them are a little yeah. bit different too, just so folks know. Um, people are sharing slots intentionally together. So like they're going to trade off like one person does the first Saturday, the next person does the second Saturday of the month, that kind of stuff too. So we're really getting creative to make the schedule as accessible as possible for people who don't necessarily, can't necessarily pull off a weekly live show every week. People are slot sharing and doing all kinds of creative stuff. So yeah. Any other questions? You all are troopers for hanging out this long. We just chat. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> it's like long enough for the that's what talk radio is for. We'll do that on the air later on. Um, thank you all very much. We will see you next week. Uh, this is recorded. So for folks who need to come back to it, uh, you totally will be able to. I'll share it um, later on uh, this week. Have a great evening. See you all later. Good night. Nice.